Hello and welcome to the Sovereign Collective Podcast, where we bring you real raw truth for your self-empowerment. I'm your host, Sasha Calavota, and I believe that you can stand on your own two feet, but that you don't have to do it alone. I love learning from people who continually strive to raise the bar, to go against mainstream thinking, and who dare to question the general consensus. People are risking ridiculed or even risk the loss of their professional status as they bravely question the common narratives and challenge the rest of us to expand our minds and to reconsider what we think we already know. Join me in learning how to take control of your health and your mind so that you can have the energy to think more clearly and the confidence to step up and take responsibility for all aspects of your life. We promise to never censor here because I believe you are strong enough to hear the real raw truth to make up your own mind. If you like what you find here at the Sovereign Collective Podcast, then please share with your friends and family. I so appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in. And now, on to the show. Hey everyone, Satya here with another interview for the Sovereign Collective Podcast. And today I'm with Rhea Tarnava. I didn't even ask if that's how you pronounce your name, Rhea. Is it Tarnava or Tarnava? How do you say the accent? I like to oh, give Rhea Tarnava. Rhea Tarnava. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Rhea Tarnava. And we're going to be talking about the bio field, our electricity, our current. We're going to be talking about the subtle energy of the body. It's a real thing, folks. And it's something that is super powerful in informing us of things that might be keeping us stuck, why we're ill, why we're in the, the mental state that we are. And there's so many ways to work with it, to read it and to tune it, not by me, but of course, by people like Rhea and people that have these these abilities, right? These abilities to really tune in and hone in on the enormity of what actually constitutes this human body, because it's certainly not just what we see. It's certainly not just what we can cut out and poison and things like that. There's all their measurable things that, that we need to pay attention to. So Rhea, she's formally actually trained originally as an architect, but has been working in the world of natural medicine and researching it for over 20 years and now works with clients and with a, with the method that she's developed around biofield tuning and other, and I'm going to let her explain that a little bit better. And I have a thing to read about it, but she's working with people. And also she's very educated and still currently seeking, uh, working on a PhD as she's helping people with their stuff. So she's super intuitive. She's got a gift to really read the field, to hear the field. And I had the pleasure of having an appointment with her last week and my husband the week before and seeing what can be revealed through our fields and, and retuning and with tuning forks and things like that. So it's pretty super fascinating, actually. So Rhea has learned from many um, pioneers in the field, like people like Carolyn Mez and Wayne Dyer and Bruce Lipton and Dr. Dr. Joe Spenza, you know, all these people that have been around for a long time and they've proven, I think, through the longevity of their presence on the world stage, you know, like just the validity of what they are talking about and how it's constantly actually evolving and evolving and becoming, I'm hoping, eventually more mainstream, right? This is This is part of owning our health. And this is why I really focus on all these different things where we can really step up and take responsibility for our health. So let me tell you a little bit about Rhea's infinite energy method that she has developed. She developed this method, which is a powerful intuitive modality based on concepts from quantum physics and delivered through the use of tuning forks to create vibration and sound beneficial in transforming the subtle energies of the body, subtle bodies, mind, emotions, spirit, and biofield. This complex multidisciplinary method was founded in practices such as traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic energy medicine, Ayurveda, Ayurveda, sorry, energy medicine, applied kinesiology, somatic release, Qigong, and health coaching. So a whole bunch of stuff. You're just throwing it all in there. Rhea also teaches classes and helps people learn this for themselves so that they can either help themselves or coach others. So classes are designed to both develop a practitioner's individual intuitive abilities, as well as to facilitate changes in client health and wellness on all levels. This method was founded on the principle of the whole person, teaching students to assess and make connections to one of the four major human energy groups, which include the chakras, meridians, the biofield, and the subtle energy bodies, as well as accessing the physical body through acupuncture points, neurolymphatic points, and meridian alarm points. Maria, this is super uh, uh, like all encompassing. This is wow. So there are three levels required for certification in the infinite energy method, tuning the chakras, vibra acoustic body work and biofield timeline repatterning. 
And additionally, there'll be three advanced levels which go much deeper to transformative energy work using vibroacoustics for advanced practitioner certification. So the first advanced class currently available is tuning. Where am I going here? Tuning brave wave frequencies coming in 2024 and 2025 will be tuning into the five elements in advanced biofield practices. Infinite energy sessions are tailored to each individual needs and no two sessions are ever the same. So you can interact with Rhea in terms of being a client and having a practitioner client relationship, but also a teacher student relationship. And if this is something that you feel resonates with you, then please, I will give you all the information with how you can contact Rhea and how you can pursue that. So Rhea, thank you so much for joining me today. We have so much to talk about and uh, thank you for sharing your gifts. I'm super excited to find that you are in my neck of the woods because you know there's people out there online but it's always nice to connect with somebody in person so so glad we had that chance thank you very much sasha it's a pleasure to be here with you today thank you okay so before we get into all this work before we get this like what led you you were an architect you you were business or you created you're you're quite you're an inventor you do all these interesting things so why energy medicine what led you to start developing this uh, so my journey kind of through changing, I guess, careers or lanes um, really started out with my family. I was I was uh, born into a family. I'm an only child, um, but my father was already not well when I was little. And so um, I feel like you develop uh, intuitive skills or abilities when, you, especially when you have a parent that's not well, because you're, you're constantly trying to tune into their health to see how how they're feeling. So my dad had open heart surgery when I was seven and we kind of went through, you know, all of those sort of health things with him and with my grandma and, you know, and then my dad passed when I was quite young. I think I was 22 when he passed. Um, and so then as my mom kind of got older and started to uh, have health problems, it was, it was re sort of reconnecting with those intuitive abilities, but on a higher level. So um, so back, you know, probably when I was 28, 29, I went back to university and I started in on a second uh, degree, just part time. Um, and I would sort of thought that I was going to be a naturopath. So I was doing sort of a pre-med to get into naturopathic school. And, you know, like three quarters of the way through that, I kind of decided that that really wasn't my lane. It was too close to Western medicine mm -hmm. where at, you know, the body in a wholly reductionist way and just using supplements instead of pharmacology, but it was really still a lot of the same sort of shtick. So, um, so I completed it, but, but it kind of stayed in my back pockets. And then I discovered, um, through, just through a connection, something called therapeutic touch. And so that was in my early thirties and I trained in therapeutic touch and spent time with that group. And that's a little bit more of a, an esoteric a sort of intuitive process where you're working with the energy of the body and you're training your hands to feel the energy of the body. So um, in the United States, uh, I don't think so much here, but in the US, they they have therapeutic touch nurses that will go in the operating room, especially when they're doing transplants. So they will imprint the energy of the organ that they're transplanting. Um, and so, you know, statistics and studies have shown that people will have a much successful, more successful transplant when a therapeutic touch practitioner or nurse uh, goes in the operating room with them. So, so this was kind of like my journey, like what, what allows this to happen? Right. And I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm like that kid that drove my parents crazy. I was telling the client, always asking questions. And um, so I wore them out with my question asking, because I just had to know everything about everything of how everything works. And, and that kind of translates into anything, whether it's plumbing or architecture or your health, I, I just, uh, I have a very inquisitive mind. So so that kind of led me down the road of finding CIHS, which is the university I currently go to. Um, it's located in Encinitas and they are affiliated with other universities. They do work with the Chopra Center uh, as well as UCSD. Uh, we'll use their lab sometimes. But um, it's, um, it's an interesting school because it marries, uh, it was uh, developed and opened with private funding by Hiroshi Motoyama about 25 years ago, we just had our 25th anniversary of the university. And um, he marries consciousness and um, spirit back with science. So it's a social science school. Our biggest department is psychology. And I'm in this little obscure department called um, integral health life physics. So there aren't that in there, but it's a very research based. So everything that you do, you're constantly doing studies and 
um, trying to, and, and practicums as well, like developing practicum sequences where you can then do a study. So it's a wholly scientific way of looking at the intuitive and the um, consciousness of everything, because this is the big failing, the big epic failing of Western medicine is that we've taken spirit or consciousness out of science. And that just doesn't work because there is there is this level of magic that you just can't describe using Newtonian terms. It just, it's an epic fail. And not only have we taken consciousness out of science, we've taken science out of science. <laughs> we are calling things scientific when there is no scientific anything right. behind it. Well, it's the opinion of the highest bidder, so. Right. You know, the highest bidder is paid for their opinion and that's what's pushed as an agenda. And it's wholly, you know, mostly not the truth. Or maybe there's a vein of truth that it hasn't been fully explored or developed. And yeah, I mean, it's it's really not. It's become dogmatic. Science has become the new religion. Right, right, exactly. So you did the therapeutic touch and that led you eventually. Now, so you're currently doing a PhD, correct? Yes, yeah, I finished my master's about a year and a half ago, and it was a joint master's PhD program, so now I'm continuing on at the university, and and um, this is a great way of doing it, actually, all at one school, because um, in your master's degree, you'll take all the courses, all the variety of different courses that will really help you hone in on what it is you want to study in your PhD, so I did a lot of my master's degree studying water, um, and the water in the body, and what we can do with water, you know, energetically, um, I did studies on psilocybin, how does psilocybin affect the water, mm. really interesting things, pilot studies that could have really been developed into large clinical trial studies. And so I'm very um, much in the know of what I'm going to do for my dissertation. I've already started work on it, even though I still have coursework left to finish. And it will be working with the infinite energy method. There will be, you know, a, an aspect of water in there because I feel like looking at the water before and after, especially uh, fluids from the body before and after, you know, gives us um, a really good indication of of how we're working with the energy to make changes. And um, and I've seen it. I've seen miracles all the time in 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 clinic. And this is why I think it's important as a scientist to have a clinical practice because if you don't, how are you marking your results? Um, I to make changes on the fly because I see what works and what doesn't. And I've got that kind of brain that I can retain um, memory of each of these sessions in, in so much as on the fly, I can make changes. So I'll, I'll, you know, I'll correlate information and then I'll change up what I'm doing. So even the methodology, the infinite energy method, it's, it's, it's a fluid, you know, method. It's not set in stone where I'm going to teach the same thing 10 years from now. I've already made tons of changes to the curriculum as we go along because you'll discover new things and you want to incorporate that at the right teaching level. So so that's something I think that makes me different than a lot of methods that I've taken where, you know, it's information that somebody came up with 20, 30 years ago and they're just, you know, remarketing it or rebranding it. I don't do that. So right. there's a new discovery or a new thought process, then the curriculum is updated and immediately sent to the students that have taken the program so that they're, they've got the latest, greatest, up to datest. <laughs> right, right. And so you're working with, Forks. Are you also using, what do you think about, the, so oh, I'm going to talk with, I want to ask this question, but then let's get into, let's talk about why, how we can even do this, what we are and how we can actually even do what you're doing and what you're measuring actually. But before that, I'm just wondering, there's a lot of gadgets out there these days. There's a lot of energy medicines out there these days. And you, from what I gather, and maybe I'm wrong, you seem to be primarily working with tuning forks. And I'm wondering, how does that compare to other electrical devices that might be affecting your frequency or emitting frequencies? And what is your opinion on those as opposed to the tuning forks or other things that can work with the energy field? Well, so so like you say, in the lab at the university, they, they do have quite a few different instruments. And so we have the opportunity to go do classes in person and and work with some of this equipment. And honestly, like I, I guess the, the my my bigger answer to that question would be that when when you are like very intuitive, that's what intuitive means is just being very very in in a deep connection with the truth of all things, the truth in all matters. And so when I'm auditing equipment, like I'll look at it from the scientific point of view, but but really it's my intuition about it that kind of takes the lead for me. Um, because like, it's like you say, there's, there's over probably now, 
I, I think the last number I saw on the internet was 1200 different devices um, that disease. Yeah. And so like, I would kind of start out there by going back to Royal Raymond Rife. You know, he was sort of the, the original kind of pioneer of using frequencies. Um, two things that made what his work was magic. The first one was that he was a guy that developed and built microscopes. So the universal microscope he built, he was able to see pathogens on a level that even today we are not able to duplicate. Um, and so when he would see these pathogens from looking at a body fluid, whether it was blood or whatever, <clears throat> he was able to then dial in the frequencies to um, explode or eradicate that one pathogen. So he's not doing like sweeps of millions of frequencies. Uh, the second thing that I think made it magic is he was using the old technology of tubes and transistors. It's, it's what I call warmer electric energy. I feel like a lot of this digital electric stuff that we have now, I would call that like how it feels to me is cold electrical or electric <laughs> energy. And I, I feel like there's a difference. I feel like the warm energy of the tubes and the transistors and all of this, um, it, to me, it more would be like the sun versus like an LED light. You know, you're getting this full, full, full spectrum of, of frequency range. I don't know. Like, and I, I know that there would be a million people that would just, you know, uh, would disagree with me, but it's a feeling. Like you say, I have to trust what I feel. And, and so um, there is somebody named uh, Anthony Holland that I've been in touch with. I've been uh, watching his work for about 13 years and he's kind of re reinvented uh, or re um, established a bit of Rife's work. And he's done a lot of work with uh, blood cancers and um, feminine cancers like uh, And so he was actually, and, and like, I haven't seen anything out of him in a long time, but he did dump a bunch of research last year and he's now hiding. He's had to leave the U.S. and he's in hiding mm -hmm. somewhere. Of course. Bad story, right? Clearly they came after him and threatened him because the last YouTube video, I think is 10 or 13 years old, but it shows him actually, you know, uh, finding a resonant frequency for a pathogen, mm -hmm. destroying the pathogen live, like right, right on, on the stage. Um, so he's clearly figured out, you know, some of the secrets of, of Rife's work on a higher level. But this is why I feel like a lot of these modern, you know, they call them Rife machines. Uh, why I think a lot of these modern Rife machines are very hit and miss. Because what I found in clinic is if somebody, let's say, let's pick cancer, because that's one that really eradicates your energy. So somebody's really far down the road of cancer, they're really quite ill and they have very little energy is left in their meridians and, and other bodily, you know, energy systems to fight the disease. And then you're pumping them through like, you know, terahertz worth of frequency. So you'll run, you know, I can think of one specific Rife machine that'll run uh, those frequencies from like a million to three million hertz. And, and that's cycling through the body. And I sort of feel like when the body is already in that, that state, it's too much it's too much and it'll take them out of the game. And I've seen that on a smaller level, even in my own clinic, you know, with people that were very near the end of their journey and they waited a little bit too long to seek help. And even just using my tenant device, because I've got a biomodulator and biotransducer and that's what I feel is a little bit safer because it's, it's microcurrent technology. So you're either using a scalar wave uh, um, device to distribute the frequencies or you're using pads right on the body. So you're you getting that benefit of the vibration as well as the frequency. Um, so I've never actually purchased any of these modern Rife machines myself, just because anytime I've gone for sessions, I felt so uh, de-energized, so devitalized and so depleted after a session that I just couldn't bring myself to buy one. Wow. Wow. Oh that have benefited from it. And maybe, you know, those are the people that have that very strong chi uh, kidney energy. But if you're already looking at a deficient kidney and bladder meridian lines, might not be for you. Interesting, right? And there's, there's the subtleties in that too. And I think that's where the intuition of the practitioner is huge as well. Like, I think a lot of these modalities are only as good as the practitioner and their intuitive abilities, whether it be a biofeedback session or even the forks or right, all of that stuff. There's also another component that's not teachable or measurable. You know, somebody has to be in that state. So interesting. We thought out early on in the game that developing the intuition of the practitioner is paramount. 
So it's a big part of my program where a lot of the stuff, like I've taken Eden Energy Medicine, I've taken tuning, like all sorts of different classes and modalities and methodologies. And, and never once did anybody talk about developing intuition, except for Barbara Brennan. She's really the only one that I can think of, Hands of Light and the Barbara right. Brennan. They're big into that. And, and I feel like that's extremely important. So I incorporate that because if you cannot trust yourself and your level of discernment in helping somebody, man, you better not be out there trying to help somebody because that's, again, going to be another fail. Um, you have to develop your intuition to the point where you're in full trust of yourself and the knowledge that you're getting that is for the higher benefit of the person, no matter how crazy it sounds. I mean, I say stuff out loud that like five years ago, it would have never, never said this stuff out loud. <laughs> the universe right trust the messages I'm getting and and I actually like kind of comically refer to myself as the the universal switchboard operator because I'll get information even about family members and it always surprises me like how do I know this stuff you know I'll talk with my husband after a session sometimes and I'll just be like blown away like how is this happening this is like utter magic um the field right the field the information is in the field right there so we're all connected in that way all it is really is just learning how to sharpen your antenna so that you're picking up those frequencies because it's really all they are. I mean, we look back even over history, right? And on the same day in history, two different inventors submitted patents, patent requests for the telephone on the same day. I mean, once you have an idea, and, and I feel like the magic is if you keep it to yourself, that's one thing, right? Because you're not broadcasting. Um, but as soon as you start talking about your ideas, and the universe heals you, hears you, the field hears you, that, that, that goes somewhere. And so somebody else can pick that up and decipher that. And, and that can be their idea too. And I feel like the universe works like this because a lot of us have great ideas and we'll talk about it, but we don't have that other part. We don't have that open sacral center that allows us to really birth it into the world. So we might be all up here and have these great ideas, but there's nothing going on down here that we're allowed to birth that into the world. So thank God there is a field that retains this information and passes it on to somebody else who has that ability to, to bring it into the world. Yeah. And I've experienced that on small levels several times and thinking, Oh my God, I wasn't, I just talking about that. And there it is. So, okay. So, so we can ground this conversation when we're, what is this body? What are you measuring? What is this magnetic field? This electrical field? What, what allows this to happen? Where, Let's talk about the other levels of who we are that we don't see and what kind of information is carried there and the depth of where that can take us. So I like, again, through the methodology that I've developed, I sort of honor all of the, um, the different, uh, I guess, ancient ways of dealing with energy. So like, for example, you know, the, in the Vedic system, the, the idea of the chakras and what they represent and the themes. And it's it's sort of like a larger energy body that will pull in information. And then you look at the meridians and, and alarm points and neural lymphatic points from Chinese medicine and working with those and shifting energy, the energy once it's brought into the body, now I've got to work with the meridian system to kind of push that around. And then you sort of look at the subtle bodies. So the layers around the body and how those, um, and I like Barbara Brennan's work for that, how the outer layers of the subtle bodies will actually pull in and template information in the in the lower layers so there'll be like a template layer for the mental there'll be a template layer for the astral <clears throat> because the way that the subtle bodies work around us um, is no different kind of than how the earth is you know the earth has the ionosphere and all these layers stratosphere all these other layers out there right of, of, of energy and, and as that energy gets closer and closer to, or to the earth, that's what becomes physical. And it's the same with us. You know, we're in this 3D environment. And so we've got all of this energetic information fields that exist around the body. And there's all these different ways that we pull it in. And so as you get closer to the body, the subtle energies become more dense. So they're finer and more particulate way out at arm's length. And as we bring them in, they become more dense. So let's say I've experienced a trauma in my life and I'm kind of holding this out here and, and it's an emotional trauma, but I'm, I'm holding it out here in this template layer. So this is now, this is now like kind of like, think of it almost like a corruption of the blueprint. 
Um, we, we're holding this knot and we're bringing it in and bringing it in and bringing it in. And then by the time it becomes physical, it becomes a body problem. So now you're going to have a pain or an ache or an illness that's associated with this thought or this emotion that you're holding out in your. So for people that don't know about biofield stuff and they're saying, what are you talking about? I've got a memory of trauma out here. I'm right here. How, how am I, how am I having it outside of me? Can you explain what that would, what that means for people? So like I say, I mean, my research is, is through studying a lot of ancient traditions. So, you know, for anybody who wants to really explore this on a deep level, is really looking at what they do with Vedic medicine and really what they do with traditional Chinese medicine and, and how we've got thousands and thousands of years of knowledge. Like most people don't realize Western medicine is about 150 years old. Chinese medicine, we're talking five, 6,000 years old. Right. Like we got to put it into perspective that yes, there's this great technology that has been born out of Western medicine. And I'll tell you, like if, if I was in a car accident and broke something or severed something, I certainly don't want you poking me with needles or, you know, you know, using tuning forks. There's a place for everything. <laughs> the degenerative, regenerative medicine and, and all of these problems that we're having with our healthcare system is solely because we're only looking at the body. So like I look at the four pillars of health, kind of like the Russian system. So you look at the mind and the emotions and they're separate and the body and this, the spirit. So, so there's four different places that I'm kind of putting my energy. So if I'm only addressing my body through Western medicine and, you know, I have a pain in my hand, so that certainly must mean there's something biomechanically wrong with my hand. That's an error. I, I, I mean, I can give you an example. I had a client who came to me with a tremor and it was found through, you know, doing work with uh, emotional repatterning in the bio field that it had nothing to do with that. It was, it was actually um, a, a physical assault that had taken, that had caused um, an emotional response. And, and it was so impactful that it, it developed a tremor. And so Western medicine looks at the tremor and they're like, well, let's, we'll send you for an x-ray. We'll palpate it. You know, uh, we'll, we'll send you for all these different diagnostics and then ultimately can't find anything wrong with the arm, you know, that's causing the tremor. So then it's like, well, now we're going to give you a medication um, that's, that should reduce the tremor. So for this individual, they gave him a uh, bisoprolol, which is like what you give somebody if they have tachycardia, which is heart rate that's too fast. Mm -hmm. And so heart rate down to the point where he had no energy and didn't do anything with the tremor. And it was, which is wholly frustrating. It had nothing to do with the biomechanics of his arm, but that's where he was holding the emotional impact of this, like I say, this in altercation was right. in. Right. So before we keep going, I think you have your email on. Could you turn that off? Because it keeps getting big, loud beeps, I think, when you have an email come in. But yeah. Can you check that? Hopefully it's not. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. So is it, in your opinion, are most physical maladies a result of what's happening out here, outside in our field? A good one. Unless there's been an ex accident or, you know, something like that, unless it was an actual physical trauma. Um, so I think, yeah, like, I mean, things that are, um, you know, inflammatory, I think a lot of that relates back to, um, a thought process or an emotion. So it can also be limited thinking thought forms will also cause disruptions in the biofield. So if I have this, you know, limited thinking, like I'm fat, I'm fat, I'm fat, I'm fat. Like I'm going to eventually manifest fat because I keep telling myself I'm fat. Um, so what we're thinking and ruminating on and speaking into the world like if I say it all the time oh this outfit makes me look fat or you know just as an example um it's going to be manifesting a lot of that thinking and so the danger being for humans is that five percent of our communication is conscious and 95 percent is unconscious so there's a big component of what's running in your unconscious program that's causing you to not feel well and I mean this is why I kind of attack it from multiple different levels why I I look, I look at the biofield, right? And I look at the subtle bodies, but I'm also looking at the meridian energy and working with the body itself. And now the latest greatest is working with brainwave frequencies. Um, your body generates its own frequencies, your heart and your brain generate, generate frequencies. So when I, and I actually got this in a, 
in a meditation. Um, your audience will probably be okay with that. I got to be careful where I say that, but but I'm a prolific meditator and I get a lot of downloaded information in meditations. And it's stuff that I don't even always understand. And I then have to go look it up on the internet or look it up in books. Like, what is this trying to tell me? But for just over a year, I meditated that I wanted frequencies that were going to help um, repattern the DNA or repair DNA damage. And so one day I was sitting at my desk and I was actually on a phone call and these numbers like started coming. And so I know what that is because I've had that happen often enough. So I quickly uh, got rid of my phone call and started writing them down. And that night I, I really sat with these numbers and tried to figure out what they mean. Um, and so, you know, because I like numerology and stuff, I kind of started by adding them all up. Like, what does this mean? And so I very quickly noticed that when you add up the frequencies, they would equal three, six, nine, three, six, nine. Mm. So something special going on because that's like Pythagorean scheme or vortex math. And so then I kind of studied them a little bit more and figured out that they're, they're spreads, they're brainwave frequency spreads. So when you're doing like binaural beats, when you're working with binaural beats in music um, to, to do things with frequencies in the brain, you'll put one frequency in one ear and another frequency in the other ear and your brain will create the beat. So for example, if I have like 10 Hertz on this side and 40 on this side, I'm going to have 30 Hertz. And it's, it, it's called a beat because your brain actually makes this up. It, it doesn't actually exist. It's, it's the brain creating this. And so, so like I say, that really started like a year worth of research. It took me an entire year last year to, to come up with um, all of the information. And I did two classes through university where I was able to devote all that research time into understanding how we can work with these brainwave frequencies, not just around the ears, but through the body to, to repattern, um, you know, like, like uh, disease states or pain, pain remediation. Um, it works fantastically well for people who are having uh, psychological issues. So, you know, depression, or they've maybe they've been on some sort of medication for a really long period of time, and they're having all sorts of terrible side effects from that. So I've been working a lot with trauma and developing protocols around PTSD and depression and trauma. And I'm trying to understand the difference between how it feels to have like an acute anxiety versus a chronic one. You know, if I've had it for my whole life versus I've only had it for a couple of weeks and what that means in the treatment of the issue. And so these, I've been finding that these frequencies working like, like directly on the body or around the ears, I have like incredible, incredible results, like shocking results. Um, and I can share a really interesting uh, clinical example of that. So I had a client with an appointment uh, supposed to come and she phoned me and she said, I've got a friend who's literally waiting out. He's at the hospital and they want to keep him for several months in the psych department and his wife and him don't want really to do this because of course they'll just pump him full of medication, right? Mm -hmm. And he's just not really into that. So by the time he got here, like from the hospital, they literally brought him straight over. Wow. Um, he was like crawling out of his skin. He was shaking. Um, he was, he was kind of like, you know, moving and rubbing his eyes were rolling back into his head. Like, like I really questioned whether this was too much. It was quite scary. So I, I sat him down in the chair and just tried to talk with him a bit to understand what he had brought this on. So we did that for maybe 15, 20 minutes and then got him onto the table. And at the time I had just finished developing the brain protocol, I'd been, you know, using it on people and trying stuff, but I'd never tried it on anybody as severe as that. And so it's a full vagus nerve reset. You're working directly over the, the dorsal and sympathetic branch on the back and the ventral branch on the front. And so it's working with acupuncture points and neural lymphatic points that, that correlate and correspond to different aspects of, of a mental a break, right? And so we did the, the calming around the ears and cycled him down from beta to delta where he could relax and then began working with the points on the back and the points on the front. And so as, as I'm kind of going through protocol after protocol, he's getting better and better. At first, this writhing stopped, then the, then the, um, the shaking stopped. And by the time we were done at the end of the 90 minute session, he was falling asleep on my table. Wow. And so this is the forks that you designed, right? The weighted forks that you designed and you're using those on the other side of this body and you're using them on the body. 
on the body. Wow. That is incredible. And what, what kind of trauma would have ensued and like potentially, you know, just getting more and more up level the problem that he's dealing with if he were in the hospital, what would they do? They'd give him some shock treatment and they give him medication and they would not empower him and know, let him know that his body, like this kind of thing is just so powerful. Look how quickly, 90 minutes. And then mm -hmm. was he good after that? I mean, I had spoken with his wife and asked, asked her to let him sleep because, you know, the, the part of the reason that he dug himself into such a big hole was that he hadn't been sleeping. And so the doctor's I, uh, answer to that was to stick him on clozenopam, which is a, it's an anti-seizure medication and they use it for sleeping. And I've done some research on this because I've got several of Dazepam, clozenopam, they're all the same. And and they're, they're terrible what they end up doing to the brain and the nervous system. So, I mean, he's, his healing journey really has just begun, but I feel like that was a big step in the right direction, at least. Well, and you probably have, you gave him the capacity to calm down and get the wherewithal to see, oh, wait, all's not lost. And I have some power here, right? Like when you go and you're just at the mercy of the doctors and their medicine and their devices, you're completely powerless. Well, exactly. And so a lot of what I feel like I'm here to do in this world is to give people their power back and realize that they they don't have to hand it over to somebody just because they wear a white coat. We, we have this healing ability within us. You watch your animal, watch my dog, right? He goes out, he hurts himself, he comes in, he licks it. He, he, he'll maybe not eat that day or he'll maybe eat grass to make himself grow up. Like animals are very intuitive about their health. We've just had it whipped out of us, you know? It's not that we don't know what to do. We just don't trust ourselves anymore. So it's re-engaging the individual in my practice to learn to retrust that. And, and then like they say, the ones that do their homework, because I will give homework energy exercises, whether it's tracing meridians or holding, you know, hormone points or doing something, it's all part of the empowerment process. And that's where the big changes happen with clients. I mean, I'll tune you up and get you balanced before you leave. But it's what you do after you leave that's the magic. And so people that really can buy into it and honor themselves enough to do the work. I've seen people heal from crazy things that should have been dead. Honestly, I mean, it even shocks me. Like, I mean, I have one client and her story is just amazing. Um, so she, when she came to me, she was like in the, maybe I think about the 27th percentile of lung capacity. So not breathing well, right? And she had taken the vaccines, the COVID vaccines, which I don't think were helping her. Um, and also they had her on high doses of prednisone. So she had put on a lot of weight and was retaining a lot of fluids. So that was also a level of discomfort that's not helping the lungs. So I probably had, and I'd have to count it up, but somewhere between 16 and 18 sessions with her over the course of eight months. So it's pretty intense to begin with. But this lady was down and determined she was going to get better. So she did her exercises multiple times a day and, you know, any sort of supplements that I recommended or whatever, or devices, um, she was just all on board with wanting to get better. And so our, in our last session, she had lost, uh, just about 55 pounds, wow. um, got her off the prednisone early in the game. She didn't even have, like, she didn't even tell her doctor. She's like, it's just, I don't, I want to go off this. And Good. It's all up to them. Like I say, I don't force anybody to do anything, but she kind of knew that the prednisone was an issue. So we tapered her off that, worked on the adrenals, because of course now her adrenals are going to be ravaged from taking prednisone for years. That's what it does. It shuts your adrenal down. So we did a lot of working with hormones, a lot of working with that kidney chi. Um, and now today she's walking two miles a day where she couldn't walk around the kitchen and enjoying her dozen grandkids and her lungs are back up into that 70th percentile. Yay, amazing, amazing. Some. Pardon? Got her life back and then some. And some, right, exactly, exactly. So I wanna just finish back the, the question before. So would you say that we are an electrical body with a magnetic field around us? Is that what's being actually measured? Well, the brain and the heart both create an electromagnetic field. So that's, I, I believe, you know, what I think makes our biofield. I think it's it's the heart and to a lesser degree, the brain. So the heart creates electromagnetic energy. And the biofield, you would describe that as or define that as what? 
Uh, so kind of like I say, compare comparative to the earth, we just we have these layers of, of information. They are just part of uh, it's it's like part of our body. It's just like your finger. Your biofield isn't just another body part, but it's just one that you, you know, most people can't see. Some can. Um, some are training themselves to be able to see energy around the body. On a really good day, I can see about two and a half, three feet out. Um, on not day, I can still see several inches out so I can get an idea of what's going on. But it's 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 light, it's sound, it's free, it's you know vibrational frequencies. Every 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 body part creates a vibration, so that's adding to the biofield. You know, the liver vibrates on a different frequency than the spleen, so all of that creates part of our field, and that's why I think you can find bits and pieces that correlate with it out and around the body. Right. And what so, kind of information is in this field outside of us? This is our memories. This is our past. Is that what we're looking at there? I think it's it's we hold we hold everything about ourselves and our health and our interactions. I mean, your brain is like think of your brain kind of like the TV, right? And so all of this stuff is broadcast in and out of your brain, and your brain is maybe the decoding device to some degree, but that doesn't mean that other body parts aren't decoding stuff too. Like if your liver is hurting and asking for help, it's because there's something out there that it's holding you know, and will likely have something to do with probably anger and frustration. So each body also has an emotion associated with it. Right. So when I know that somebody is suffering in a particular emotional department, I'll go look into the organs that hold that energy to see if, you know, that's kind of the first line of defense. So that kind of, that comes from Chinese medicine. And so like, like, again, like the magic to me is taking all of this and and making soup out of it because there's there's little bits of truth in everything. There's little bits of the correct way of dealing stuff in all methodologies and all thought processes. But when it's when you put it all together that it now starts to make a bigger big makes sense on a bigger picture level. So like I say, I I really enjoyed studying biofield tuning and taking biofield tuning and there's there's some interesting stuff that came out of that for me. But that was a very small part of the pie. Uh, because it doesn't address, you know, one's intuition and, and that whole aspect of it. It's uh, it's more of a very mechanical process where anybody can do it. You know, you just pass through and you train yourself to listen. And some people will get information and some people won't. And that's okay. Like, it's it's a good sort of standalone for that. But if you're looking for the deeper work where you're actually going to heal on multiple levels, then you need something that addresses multiple levels. Right. Of course. Of course. And I'm really surprised that those other methodologies don't address the intuitive part of things. That is really quite surprising for me because I would feel that anybody who's drawn to that kind of work would have to some degree a more developed intuition just because it's not, it requires it. it they just go together. It's just an obvious thing. So I'm quite surprised. So what other things, so you have different modalities. So your, your methodology, that's a combination because you have different services that you offer. So somebody can come and have their, they can even learn to use forks with you, right? There's, you will offer a lot of different services. So what is the tenant therapy? What is that that you're doing? And what can somebody expect when they come for a session with you? Okay. So like tenant medicine is looking at the body as an electrical device. So there's polarities in the body. And so how Dr. Tenant kind of qualifies that is again, using the meridians and how the meridians are paired. So like, for example, heart and gallbladder are pair. So, so you would use the handheld device with an electrode and you would test points on the body that correspond with those. And you're trying to determine what's out of balance. So it's, it's sort of using a device to do it. Um, and then you would, you would treat the person based on what you find. So you're, you're balancing the body as an electrical device. And so that works really good for people who've got like a lot of muscle pain or fascia, connect, connective tissue pain. Um, I'll use like foot plates, hand plates, and, and try to get just get their body filled with energy. And then, like I say, we'll go checking these terminal points and we'll balance those terminal points. We'll do it that electric way. But infinite energy method also does that where you don't need a $14,000 device. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so a lot, not a lot of people want to invest in that. But I, I mean, I do use Dr. Tennant's device, like I say, for other things too. So um, you can use it with pads. So you can use it directly on the body. Um, I guess one example would be 
uh, somebody who's had the, like, let's say their back go out. I had one client who was a drywaller and his back went out. And so doing a session to rebalance the polarity in those muscles that are seizing around his back and causing the pain. Okay. So more of a, that's more of an on the body treatment. It's not so much of a, and I've also used it actually, I would say for allergies and intolerances, I'll, I'll use, I'll use that too. Sometimes that can be helpful when you're working with an intolerance using a scalar device. Okay. And can you explain this for people who don't understand what scalar waves are, scalar energy, what is scalar, what is scalar waves? What are scalar waves? Scalar waves, um, the, the easiest way to describe it is uh, if you're, let's say you're broadcasting a frequency like this from one side and, and this from the other side and they cancel each other out. That that's the easiest way of describing scalar. It's it's a longitudinal wave. It's not a sine wave, and so it's it's like it's a direct sort of form of energy. So with Tenant's device, you use the scalar and you plug it in so that you're actually broadcasting certain frequencies through the field rather than on the body. Because sometimes people are not also not well enough, or they're in maybe too much pain in the pads. The actual pulling on the muscles of the pad with the pads would be too much, or it would overexcite the nervous system. So, so we can use a scalar device and it broadcasts that. So you're not actually touching the body. Ah, okay. Okay. And so who are the, so who is this not good for? Are there people that you will not see for any reason? And what, who, who, who is your typical client? Is there a typical client and who do you like working with? And what are some of the things that you know that you have really great results with? Uh, so I'll, I'll see anybody. I don't have any rules around any of it. It's all kind of fair game as far as I'm concerned. Um, I would say I get the most people with trauma. That would probably be my highest demographic is around trauma. Again, ac acute chronic or PTSD. I get a lot of people that are looking for that emotional sort of recovery. Um, but I've worked on, like I say, very severe illnesses like cancer, lupus, Parkinson's, you know, the whole thing. They they all sort of have a signature feel to them. Um, I do a lot of, of um, the infinite energy biofield sessions where, again, it's picking up intuitive information and shifting um, shifting energy through the chakras so that it's remediating those big theme problems in a person's life. Mm. Um, doing a lot of um, biofield stuff where I go before the birth window. And so I'm looking at that time in the in-between and I've come up with some interesting um, correlations uh, by doing that in, in understanding a little bit more about karma and, and how we bring things in and, and uh, energetically what systems we're using to bring in uh, information through the veil so that we can you know, learn our karmic lessons and, and then go on to the next step. So I've been doing a lot of work around that. Um, like you say, developing ways of working with the body using traditional Chinese medicine as a foundation, but absolutely nothing like needling. Um, we, we use sound to move things through the body rather than, than needles. And so uh, developing different protocols and methodologies around that. Uh, but I mean, nobody is, nobody is off my radar. Like I, I, you know, I, if it's something that's complex, I'll usually have a consult with them over the phone. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can't think of anybody I've ever turned away. Do you see children? I do. Yeah, babies. Like I would think, what a what a beautiful way for a new being to come in. Say they've had a super traumatic birth, something. What a great way to just clear that immediately. Yeah, I and I have my youngest has was as uh, maybe three months old. <laughs> wow. So I, a lot with with babies at least not yet but I, I've seen quite a few kids and especially during like that COVID thing because they were losing their little minds you know freaking out well and uh, having a lot of trauma so I, I had quite a few kids that I mean I remember one week it was all kids I was shocked and had a single adult that whole week wow and that's a really sad thing and even where I am and, and you know being at the shop and just with classes and talking to a lot of people just seeing the level of illness and dis-ease in our younger kids, the anxiety, the emotional problems, the, the constant sickness, the weakness, the lack of energy, you know, just so atypical of what you think of when you think of when you're in your prime and you're just full of energy and you shouldn't have care in the world, you know, just all those things that I never used to think about any of that stuff as a kid. It would just 
life was just great. And whew, it's not like that anymore for children, unfortunately. So what a beautiful non-invasive way to help the children, you know, just lie there and hang out. And, and I mean, kids love sound and like, I make it very welcoming kind of environment for them. I've got lots of, you know, kind of crystals in my office and I'll let them pick one or two to hold in their hands while we're doing this. And I'll show them how to use a fork and I'll hand them the puck and, you know, and teach them how to strike a fork. Like when you, when you get them involved in their healing process, and it's interesting too, because a few of the parents have bought their kids some tuning forks, which like I think is brilliant. You know, these kids are using sound before bed to calm themselves down. Uh, I think it's like a beautiful way of introducing, uh, you know, a, a way of working with your nervous system other than taking pills. It's, it's a great thing for kids to learn that they can control their responses in their nervous system and calm themselves, self-soothe. I mean, how many adults do you know that don't know how to self-soothe? Like I, they're difficult people to be around, right? Because you're always you're always responsible for their feelings. The kids or they're dependent on substances, right? They can't they can't handle it. They just deny it and and repress it rather than deal with it. So that's what I love, you guys. If you're looking for something really cool, I, I got one of tuning forks, from Maria, and it's it's in a box and it's the heart frequency. And you hit that fork, but it resonates through that box. So we have that sitting on our table. So we'll, I'll, I like doing that first thing in the morning to set the space. And before meal time, and my son's into it, and he'll be—I call it the gong. So he'll be gonging it, and I just, I just, I don't know. And you feel it; it's really quite palpable. It's not just—it's palpable. It's real. Yeah. So, like in in one sentence, how I would sum up kind of what I do is sort of—it's like a homeopathic way of working with the energies with sound. So just as you would use the, the subtle substance to remind the body and shift it, that's what I feel like we do with sound. It's the same thought that you're working with these subtle energies. You're making a ripple effect that will ripple into the body and change the body. Because, And I've seen it time and time again. When you change the energy, you change the physiology. Right. The physiology follows the consciousness. It's not the other way around. Right. The consciousness gives rise to everything. Everything is born out of that. And so when we're altering that geometry of time and space around the body and in the body, then the body will respond and it will change. So amazing. And so how quickly, so say I've got my fork and I'm putting out that frequency. How is there, is there an association with how long somebody's been in a state and how long it's going to take them to heal? Yes. yes. And so like, that's why I say sometimes with clients, I'll have a chat with them over the phone just to make sure that I can meet their expectations because, and I could tell people it's taking you 34 years to dig yourself into this hole. Like I need some time to help you dig out um, where other people, it'll be something that's just very recent. So it's easier, maybe, maybe two or three sessions and we can deal with it. But the really big stuff, I tell people, you kind of got to give yourself a year. Um, okay. and so actually sessions will be spaced closer together. And then like I say, towards the end, it'll be like once a month, it'll just be like maintenance and making sure that they're keeping their energy systems from going back to old patterns. But I guess a year really, I mean, how many people have you talked to that have been in talk therapy for years and years and years and to what, to what result? Well, I'm a classic example. And I think that's another thing that probably that pushed me into this is because I myself was diagnosed with PTSD and I spent dollars on all these different talk therapies only to find that it made it substantially worse because you know, once you know what you know, but that back then I didn't, right? So I was trusting the system that, well, this was going to help me. And uh, and it wasn't in every, and then I would think, well, it must be the psychologist or whatever. So I'd find somebody else. And it was always the same result because when you keep talking about something, you're just recreating all of the chemical reactions and hormones in your body that keep you stuck. You're just reliving it. So we're like one of the, I mean, that I know of, we're the only species, maybe other than dolphins that can think of a memory and, and recreate all of the chemical reactions of that memory in our body. And that's the problem. Like then these, these memories and stuff become solidified. Uh, you know, like Dr. Joe always says, like the neurons that fire together, wire together. It's the same thing with trauma. You've got all these traumas that wire together and that creates a hardwired response. So it takes me some time to unwire that because there's like, there could be 50 landmines that are triggering your response. And then you go through this cascade 
of emotions. And from the outside looking in, people are like, my God, like what is wrong with that person? How can they be overreacting at such a little thing? But for you, it's the impact of 50 traumas, maybe, or 40. And so it, it doesn't match. And so, yeah, I mean, the whole idea of medicating that to me is nonsense. At no point in history has anybody ever opened up anyone's brain, taken a little scoop of their brain out, and put it on a slide with these medications. They just literally go by, well, I'm going to try this and see what this does. Try this. Like, it's a trial and error. That's, like, that's Frankenstein. That's that that scares the supreme heck out of me. I I just can't even imagine that. Like, this is such a gentle way of dealing with things. Right. And then those medications are depleting essential nutrients and they're causing an addiction. So then people are trying to get off of it and then they have to deal with the symptoms of getting off and they think they're they're getting their issues back again. But they're really their body's having a physical response to not getting the medication anymore. So there's so many traps that get people stuck into that system whereas wow look at this you can tune so do you do you recommend that people have their own tuning forks and can they ever screw themselves up with tuning forks i've got the tuning forks like i said i've got three different ones right now that i'm playing around with and i don't know i i i, I don't really know what i'm doing you've given me some tips but it's it's I, it feels good but i don't know how effective i'm being well, and that's kind of what I tell people is when you have tuning forks, you know, if it, if it gives you a headache or makes you feel any any bit unwell in any way, then then maybe that frequency that day is not working for you. Maybe you're you're saturated on that frequency. And of course, the danger being that we're now all really like overloaded with electromagnetic frequencies, right? There's so much electromagnetic radiation in our world, radio frequencies, and all these different things bouncing around between the earth and the ionosphere that we're kind of on overload. Um, but what I do know about the body and, and with certain, you know, proven frequencies, like let's say the solfeggio frequencies, you know, they're ancient chanting frequencies that, you know, whatever monks used to use to, to chant and they, that created magic. They were, they're tuned to 432 hertz there. We know that 432 is the way in 440, you know, that came out during the war by the, from the Nazis, that that was, that's that detuning of the music drives us psychologically crazy. It's probably a lot of the reason why there's so much mental health issues is because of the 440 tuning. So as long as you have forks that are tuned, like if you're using music note frequency forks, I would insist on them being tuned to 432 hertz. Mine are, I, I in my practice, I use a C and a G, and we use that a lot for clearing in the biofield. And they're tuned to 432. So you just need to be careful, I guess, what you're buying. Um, and then the other very specific frequencies, they are just specific frequencies. So, you know, if you have a 128 or whatever, that's an osteophore. You can use that for bones, nerves, tissue, connective tissue. Uh, the 256 can be used with it because it creates a binaural beat of 128. 128 will spike nitric oxide. So like it does all sorts of good things on the body. Uh, it And so again, like if your body is not... If your nervous system is fairly balanced, you know, between the parasympathetic and sympathetic, if you're good and you're you're in balance, frequencies, you should be okay with frequencies and your body should be able to deal with them. It's when you get somebody stuck in far in sympathetic dominance or far in par parasympathetic, you know, where they're in fight and flight or they're stuck in freeze. Now you got to be a little bit more careful with what frequencies you're using, because as long as your nervous system is in balance, you cannot heal. You, you cannot heal. So the number one thing that the sound practitioner needs to do is balance the nervous system before they work on anything else. How do you assess whether somebody is stuck in parasympathetic or sympathetic dominance? Um, so there's a few ways. Uh, I teach different testing methodologies, like applied kinesiology testing methodologies for testing that. But we also listen with the fork. So we'll go below the feet and above the head, and we're listening. Which side is absorbing more energy? Which side is repelling? Is one side louder than the other? Is one side sharper than the other? So there's there's a way of hearing what's going on around the, the body on the left side and the right side. And so we can do you know sweeps. We can do figure eights on the side to add more sound. And I, I check all of this. I have a bio well. Bio well is like a rough and best di uh, diagnostic that measures the biophotonic activity um, out of all of your fingertips. And you can read these biograms and it will show you the balances. Um, so 
so having like those kind of uh, methodologies that I use to prove the, in, the that the method works, the practitioner doesn't necessarily have to go out and invest in a bio well and do the training. That kind of stuff needs to happen. Those testing things need to happen when you're developing a method. That's the important part of testing everything while you're doing it. You do practicums and you do clinical trials within your practice to make sure that these methods are working so that when you teach it, the practitioner doesn't have to worry about that. Fair. And that's where it brings the science in, right? This is measurable. This is repeatable. This is right something that we don't have anymore. How many of these studies out there are repeatable, right? <laughs> who, who is assessing whether they are, are it's actually happened or not, or even those results are even actually attained? Right. Or like, so so some, using like the forks on the body as well as in the field is really important because you're absorbing different healing energies. You know, using your ears is one way, right? It's like sound waves or mechanical waves. So they're moving the medium. But as soon as you put it on the body, now it's creating a vibration. So yeah, you can pick it up through your skin too. Like if you ring a fork and you hold it above your skin, like you can you can feel it. Oh, but there's one right there. Okay. So everybody who's watching on video, you can see one of Bria's forks. Can you show that? So that's one of the weighted forks. But do you have a bunch of them there right now? Yeah, I've got all my forks here because I thought if you wanted me to do a bit of a show and tell, but you yeah, know, I do. Ears. This is how a binaural beat would work. So we've got like the divine base, and then this one is delta. So this the the difference between these two forks is going to create a beat of a delta frequency. So uh, I've created these little silicone activators here so that you can actually hit your forks together, and you put them about two inches from your head, and so your brain is creating this beat. And and delta. If I can't sleep, I grab these forks and I'll do this in bed. Ah. Uh, Sleep, people, big problems with sleep. Okay, so you just, if you can't sleep you're, and you're, you're in bed and you'll just have them behind, by your head? I'll use the delta because delta is the frequency when you're in deep, deep sleep. When you're in that REM sleep, you're in delta. And so like I say, like twice now, I've woken up with the forks on my pillow because I fell asleep while I was doing it. Just <laughs> not. It's also great for meditation. So for meditation, you would use like the alpha fork or maybe the gamma fork. And you would do that alpha brainwave frequency and it would get you deep into that meditative state. So for people who find it hard to meditate, binaural tuning, tuning forks, that's a game changer. You know, oh, that would be me. That's so great. So you would just do that before you're setting into your session, put yourself in that, put them down and go yeah. in. Would you have to do it more than once. How many times would it take? Um, I mean, I, I usually run forks in cycles of six, so I'll activate it and then count to 10. And so after a while of doing that, you get used to how long 10, you know, 10 seconds is Yeah. I keep doing those activations in meditation until I'm gone and then I'll set them down. Okay. Very cool. So these are the forks that you created through your meditation, right? These are your own personal creation. And that set is how many forks? Six. Six forks. Well, it runs five five brainwave frequencies from delta up to gamma. And so if people would like to purchase something like that, you have those for sale? Mm. Yes, you do. That's amazing. And so what other reasons? How what okay, so can let can we have an example of each one of those and how you I love the practicality of this stuff, right? It's so it brings it home for us. So what are other situations where you'd be using each one of those frequencies? Okay. We use theta a lot for memory repatterning. So the, the theta binaural would be if we're trying to work with PTSD or, or held trauma. So let's say I'm like ruminating on something and I just can't get it out of my mind. So I have a protocol where we will, again, downregulate the brainwave frequencies out of stress, out of beta, and we'll get them down to theta. And then I have them hold that. So they'll hold that in their mind until they literally cannot hold it anymore while we're activating these frequencies. And then we'll drop them down into Delta and we'll change what we want the frequency to be, or sorry, what we want the memory to be. So let's say, you know, uh, let's say somebody had a terrible birth and they don't want to remember the birth as being terrible. They want to remember it as being this beautiful experience. So they will, they will then think of it in a different way. So now I'm going to not think of it out of fear, but I'm going to think of it out of love and I'm going to apply a love filter. So when I think of that birth, I want to feel nothing but gratitude. So if fear was before, now I'm going to replace it with gratitude. So I will have them hold the memory of the birth through that lens of gratitude and we'll downregulate the frequencies of the brain. And then we will take them back up into stress again into beta and we'll see if they can remember it. 
which How do you comes somebody back up in distress because because that's what's going to happen in their life so i want to do it in the clinic where i can control it because How can it, you do it oh using the beta the beta so then I the beta okay and then that and so it'll shift their brain into beta and so then it's does the fear come back or are we holding the gratitude so the, this is what kind of the protocol will entail is, is down-regulating the brainwave frequencies and then up-regulating them and see what we get. And you, you kind of run through this, this type of methodology until now, every time I think about that, it doesn't matter if I'm stressed or I'm relaxed, I'm going to feel the gratitude and I'm not going to go into fear. Amazing. So really, really well for PTSD, especially in like, I would challenge those people who have not had any success with EMDR to give this a try because you're not relying on that eye movement, right? You can just close your eyes and relax and you're really, re you're really working directly with those different centers of the brain that hold these memories. Okay. That, um, that stuck memory, that consolidated memory is what is what really what we want to shift is anything that's consolidated and it's like a rock and it just doesn't want to move. That's what we're working with. Wow. Cool. Have we gone through all the forks? Are there, is, there, is there another one you haven't mentioned yet? Another one, and that's the gamma fork. So when you get uh, super learning, if you're studying and you need to remember stuff, um, you can lock that in with gamma because gamma will take you into those higher frequencies. Um, gamma is also what we go into when we're in extreme deep meditation. We'll keep going down, 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 and then we'll spike up into gamma, which can go up into 100 hertz, up to 200 hertz. I mean, we only look at so much, which is really sad. There's a, another researcher, his name is Dr. Jeffrey Thompson, and I've had the extreme pleasure of having him teach one class at my university just so that I could take it. Oh, and nice. This is so funny, but I love Dr. Jeff and his work. And he's discovered all of these other like uh, ultra low frequencies and ultra high, ultra high frequencies. So he's got, you know, things like epsilon that are, that are really down below. And, you know, he's given names to these. And so he's a researcher who also creates binaural beat music. And I use some of his, especially with my autistic group, I, I use his default mode network. So it's autism, amazing. Um, are, do you work with a lot of autistic? Not a lot, but I do have a few. And and I guess, you know, when you asked me who would I work with and who would I not, I, I probably would not, just because I don't have any experience in that area yet, um, anybody who's very severely affected. I work with high-functioning autism, and I've had some good success with that, but I have not, you know, had success with nonverbal or anything because I just, I haven't had a client yet in that, in that. So that's probably something that, you know, in the future, I'll put some more effort and energy into researching. But like I say, my high functioning autism kids and adults, I see big shifts and changes. And a lot of them struggle with frustration and anger. And so we get, I get them doing exercises and yeah, I mean, I can think of a few that like, they've really benefited. Their personalities have really, you know, blossomed. They're able, they're able to warm up to, you know, more social engagement, which is great. Amazing, amazing. And those forks that you created, do you also use use those on the body or are you just using them around the ears? Yeah, you, we use them on the body again in tandem. So always with the divine base and then you'll you'll choose what other frequency that you want to do. And so if we're doing, let's say we're doing acupuncture points, maybe we're doing like, like gallbladder 20 on the back of the head. So you'll activate both of the forks and you'll work those points. And so again, you're sending a brainwave frequency through the body because they're two different vibrations. So now we're, we're creating a coherence in the body where we're using a brainwave frequency to shift energy. What better way to heal something than using frequencies that are already created by your own body? Right. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And look how much we are put out of sync with just everything that's around us and especially being in a city like it's just uh, everything that you're you're exposed to just throwing you off and just even knowing it I think sometimes even knowing it for me it's just like okay I got to not give it that much power right I got to know that I am powerful and in me and that doesn't own me because I think there's so much information about the how harmful it is and to fear it and to protect yourself and to do all these things and I think we have to balance that with also owning that we are powerful and then we can have these tools to support that rather than giving away to that fear 
Absolutely. Yeah. And I, like, it's, it's, uh, it's again, a relationship that people kind of develop with, well, how does, how does this frequency make me feel? If it's making me feel jittery, then it may be a little too high for you. So you, you would go down to one of the lower ones, but like something like alpha or theta, they can, they, they'll never make you feel uh, bad because they are that, you know, theta is that frequency that we're in kind of from the age of maybe 18 months to about seven or eight. We're in that programming so that's why when I'm working with PTSD I'm working with theta because it's taking them back to that where I can unprogram right so beliefs that are being held can be unprogrammed using theta and delta interesting and what about heart brain coherence so from heart math institute we talk about they they give you that device where you can breathe and get into heart brain coherence how can you use the tuning forks to create more coherence in the body so for that, I use it, I use it in the field, but again, also on the body. And so I'm using my alpha frequency and I would activate acupuncture points that correspond. And so you're sending vibrations and then you would, you would alternate and you would use, you would switch it the other direction. Um, and then we also use it directly over the person in the field. So you'll be holding one over the third eye and one over the heart center, and then you'll be you'll be syncing those together. So there's like a whole protocol for achieving heart brain coherence. And like I say, it involves working in the field with the subtle bodies and on the body. And so quite often when you place that fork on the, on the sternum along with the, this point in Chinese medicine that kind of will correspond with the brain, uh, the person will, will always comment, oh my God, that feels so good. Oh, that energy feels so good. I've never had anybody say, oh, that's, that's horrible. Like, don't touch my head. Like, I'm <laughs> too buzzy on your head. Let me know. But everybody's, um, yeah, like, again, it's using our own generated brainwave frequencies to like sync the two together. And, you know, this is again, like what I just sort of feel like intuitively is the magic, right? We've got these three lower chakras that kind of are earthbound physical chakras. And then we've got the three higher ones that are our spiritual chakras. But when you like when you, you stand and you put your arms out, you make a cross, right? Your body makes a cross. So it's already telling you what the important one is. You know, this is the this is the conduit through which all from above and below pass. So if you're not using your heart for your thinking, then you're a psychopath or you will be. You know, if, if you're really just all brain thinking all the time and you don't use the filter of your heart emotions, that that's that's I think where the world's in so much trouble today is because a lot of these people that are running the show they're they're not in their heart it's all you know and you can see how the brain is you know like we look to society like people that are highly educated people that are um, in jobs where they're they're just all in that uh, left brain and we give that a lot of value in our in our society and so it's pushing and pushing like the statistic now is that what is it one in one in eight people are psychopaths like I swear I mean, it's even more it's shocking how how many I've come across or it's, it's just bizarre the, I at least I think they were saying one in 10 maybe they're saying one in eight now but it is very prevalent mm -hmm. right. so so that you know I sort of feel like we're 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 being drawn to really use them. The, there's over 40,000 neurons in your heart, just like your brain. It's the same thing. This is why when somebody has a heart transplant, they can often remember a lot of the, the deceased person's memories that they got the heart from. And uh, Greg book about this. It was so, so prevalent that, you know, many doctors noticing this. So, so the, the neurites of the heart, they have value. We just need to re-engage them. We need to get the heart online. So the protocol that I do, it helps to get the heart online so that you're thinking through your heart. You're experiencing everything through your heart up above and down below. And this is how we stay balanced because we are spirit and we are a body and we have to coexist. Right. So, Fair. I so love that you put that. I've never heard it put that way. That that really makes a lot of sense to me. And there is more information, I think, going from heart to brain than brain to heart. Correct. Yes. Well, actually, the 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 heart will generate more connectivity to the brain than the brain right. generates back to the brain. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So it's really important when you think about there is there's a brain down here. I mean, we call the gut the second brain, but I don't know that heart. And when you engage it and and consciously put your 
energy there and breath into there, you feel it. It's different. So, and I think if we would consciously, because like you said, our society values so-called intelligence, right? And all these skills. And we're trying to get our kids to know these things earlier and earlier and earlier. But that is not necessarily the most effective way. First of all, for learning, that's not effective to to in, introduce concepts before somebody is emotionally ready for that, you know, or whether they're matured or not for that. But also, well, who said that that's what we should be valuing? Right? I think the right. world needs a little more heart connection right now. Right, right. And even in so much as school, I mean, education in itself is, it's funny because now the pendulum is swung and, and, and people are starting to look at highly educated people as the problem. And I, I would, I would just, again, put sort of a caveat in there that it depends where and what you're being educated in. If you're going to you know, an Ivy League Rockefeller funded school and you're only learning and it's really like a routine of memorizing and regurgitating where you're really not encouraged to have your own independent thinking, then maybe that's not so much of a benefit. But if you choose wisely and you go to a school that encourages you to develop original thought uh, and it considers consciousness as a big part of the puzzle, then, then the education is serving you. You're not serving it. Right, right there. Fair, like that. Okay, so what else? So let's talk about, I have a hard cut off here today. So let's talk about how people can get in touch with you, what you've got coming up, what your offerings are in general, how people can engage with you, all the things. Okay, um, so I, I, I do teach classes all the time. I've got a level one actually coming up next weekend and I've got one or two spots left in that. <clears throat> Is that um, online or in person? It can be either. Um, it's always better to do it in person, but but we can we can also zoom you in and you can do it that way as well. So uh, so there's that. <clears throat> um, the I'm also kind of in the works of of doing something with the Universal. So they're uh, they're a studio in Marley, and so I'm looking at being able to teach classes there as well. So that would you know, open up a different opportunity because that those classes would be taught on Mondays where my classes now are always weekend. So sometimes people can't make weekends. And so that'll give, you know, so that's going on in March, the third week of March, there'll be another level one. So for people who want to sign up for that, they can do that through the universal. Um, and yeah, getting in contact with me through my website, infinitebiofieldmedicine.com is the best way to reach me. And they can look online and see all about all the different services I offer. And like you say, if they're interested in a quickie phone consult, we can do that and just talk about what they're experiencing with their uh, health and wellness goals or issues and, and what I might be able to, you know, do with them to change that or improve it. Uh, yeah. Um, and I guess the other, the other way would be through email. You can always feel free to email me through my website. There's a contact box at the very bottom. So you can reach out that way as well. And if somebody's interested and they don't know which way to, because a lot of people they don't know really like you have the services but it, it's they're not sure how it's going to benefit them what would be a good start say somebody wants to experience this and they don't know which way to go what would you suggest that they choose um so for those folks i would suggest that they fill out the intake form under the forms on the website and so i can have a look at what they're dealing with and then i would ask recommendation as to where they should start Perfect. with this and you have an online store as well if people are looking to purchase anything it's available there and there's information oh, you cut off. say that again what's available there so all of the infinite energy method tuning forks are available there and so they can read about them there's also some individual forks for people who just want to you know maybe give it a try see what it what it's like you can get a weighted fork or an unweighted or both so there's, there's other little smaller sets, but we do have our practitioner sets. So we've got, you know, uh, we've got a, a practitioner set that takes you all the way through the levels with the exception of the, the brainwave class. That's, that's a different set of forks because we're using with, with these binaural beat forks. Um, but yeah, our, the set that I offer is very, it's a very full set. There's seven tuning forks and a bunch of other things. So it's everything that you'll need to get you through levels one through six with the exception of level four. Amazing. Okay. 
Okay, is there anything else you want to say or is there something we haven't covered? Like what what do you what do you what are your last thoughts with for our listeners? Well, our thoughts would be just that, you know, we we are these these infinite beings and we do have this magic about us where, you know, we come and we experience these these physical um physical lives and they're meant to teach us something, but to just always remember to take care of that infinite self because that's who you really are. Fair. And I think a lot of people have lost sight of that especially in these last few years, people have diminished themselves to these, just these mechanical little bodies that are just a bunch of parts mm -hmm. and they have lost the magic and the curiosity. And they, it, it's just, it's to me, it's a real, I just remember the whole beginning of all this and I was marching down the street like a month after it all hit and there was this young girl walking down the street with the mask on already. And we were as a group walking and she was like, you're going to make me sick. I'm like, you're so much bigger than that. I felt so bad. Like the, the messages that our children are growing up with that you could kill grandma or how weak we are and how susceptible we are. Right. And just to help spread that message of we are so much bigger that we, than we know when there's a divine blueprint here that has been kept from us. And it's, we need to be curious and we need to, and this is, I think it's great to have the forks, even if you have a family and just play around with it with your children, you know, let them know that, and maybe play around with the sound and see if it's different and them. Just get them curious to know that there's so much more than we're being told. Absolutely. Yeah. The power, there's power in sound. You know, we, we ought not fear, we ought not fear things like death because death is not the end. It's just, it's just the beginning of another cycle. And so think of your body like your home and you want to be good to your home and you want your home to look good. And, you know, we want it to be a comfortable place to live in while you're here, but it is just a home and the real you will need to go experience something once again. Fair. Love that. Love that. Love that. Thank you, Rhea. I really appreciate your time today. I know you guys have enjoyed this. It's pretty amazing. And I hope you do share. I hope you like what you heard. If you have any questions, you can message me. Follow me on Instagram on Sasha K says, and you can respond to when I post my podcast there. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it on all the podcast platforms. Go check out Rhea's site. See what she has to offer. Check out her classes if you're interested in learning about it. The more people learn this stuff, the more we spread it and share it, the more we can bring it into, just normalize it, right? we got to normalize this stuff and stop making it so out there and special and normalize it. So thank you, Rhea. I really appreciate your time with me today. Thanks very much. It was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Everyone.